because I want to talk a little bit about another game that you might have actually played. It came out in 1984, not for the NES, but for the Commodore 64 and the Atari computers. It didn't actually make it to the NES in North America until 88. It is called Spy vs. Spy. Has anyone played Spy vs. Spy? Oh, a lot of people. Wow. Do you remember it's this game? So, it's not so forgotten. Can any of you think of a game that's like Spy vs. Spy that has come out since Spy vs. Spy in 1988? There are very few. Yeah. So Spy vs. Spy for Game Boy. It's interesting you bring Spy vs. Spy 2 for NES. It's interesting you bring that up. That was made. Hey, stop it. <laughs> it was made by a company you've never heard of called First Star Software, and there's this whole story behind it that's actually not that interesting. They made two games, Spy vs. Spy and Boulder Dash. And the company exists today, as far as I can tell, to continue to make money relicensing Spy vs. Spy and Boulder Dash. <laughs> So the deal with this game, for those of you who haven't played it, is that it is a direct versus game again. You know, two players, perfect information. There's nothing to hide, yet it's hide and seek. You have to get four items, put them in a briefcase, and go out that little door with the airplane on it. That lets you fly away. And then the building explodes and kills the other spot. <laughs> now, you can only hold one item at a time. Until you get the briefcase. So, what's, what ends up happening is you find, like, the money bag. All right. The other player sees the screen. He sees you got the money bag. This game wouldn't work if you couldn't see each other's screens. Most games, I mean, you played uh, Bond as a kid on the N64, and people would yell at you if you looked at other people's screens to see where they were and snipe them. This game, if you didn't look at the other guy's screen, you couldn't win. The game was stupid if you didn't look at the other screen. So rather than trying to like get around the limitations of the console and the split-screen multiplayer, because you couldn't really network two Nintendos together, they decided to make a game that it was okay to look at the other guy's screen. You were expected to. So I got to hide the money bag somewhere. Like I got to hide it in the bookshelf. I have to remember where I hid it. I have to remember all the traps I've laid along the way. I have to hope that he doesn't remember where I laid it, and i got to protect it from him. Yeah, the best idea is to usually put it somewhere and then put a trap in the same room, right? Perhaps like, you put a water bucket on the door of the room where you put the money bag in the dresser. But then, before you, if he tries to go in that room, he'll die, and he probably, didn't see, he probably couldn't pay attention long enough to see you set the trap and hide the money bag. So then when you go to get the money bag, you make sure you bring the umbrella with you so that the, the water bucket doesn't get you. Of course, you'll forget and just die a million times. Yeah. The game is not great. It's actually very deeply flawed due to the limitations of the console. Unlike Outlaw, which kind of maximized the potential of the console, this game, you really only have two buttons, and it doesn't work that well. Like, you have to cycle through all the traps to figure out which one you're going to use, and it's really fiddly. And if you play it on other, any difficulty other than basic, it's a gigantic map so big, I've never seen a human being beat it. Yeah, see, there's only six rooms on the easiest mode. The hardest mode is like a gigantic mansion. It's like, you can't even remember where you left your socks, let alone the money bag and the briefcase. So why don't people make games like this anymore? I mean, why don't people try to make a hide-and-seek versus multiplayer direct competition game. So here's a game that I can't get to go full screen. All right? but this game, I doubt any of you have heard right. of. So basically, in 1984, there was a company called BMB CompuScience. Right? Uh, and obviously, they were not a game maker. Right? They were a, they were a hardware maker. Uh, and they made a networking system called Imaginet. Right? Obviously, Imaginet didn't work out so well. That's why you all use Ethernet. Uh, but the idea was that if you were some company and you needed networking in 1984, there really, you know, there were a hundred different choices to choose from. So some people, I guess, might have bought Imaginet and probably went out of business because of it. It's not a very interesting story. No. But so they wanted to sell Imaginet to people. They needed some sort of software to demonstrate that used Imaginet. It was very impressive. So they had this guy, also named David, uh, David Clark, and he made a game that was a network game in 1984. It was called Sopwith. Uh, Sop with one really sucks, so I have swapped stuff with three to show you. <laughs> now, the game itself is not that amazing, right? Has anyone seen this ever or played it? Wow. Really? It must have had some. Did it make the run from the internet? It's because we're at PAX. We're looking? Yeah. I will get this thing going. So, here's the deal it's pretty much a multiplayer LAN versus oh, Choplifter Defender. Are you going to play or not? all mixed together in one. Now, Choplifter is a game that really hasn't been remade that much. Uh, Defender is a I game that's been remade that much. <laughs> I died again. <laughs> oh, 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 there he goes. It's basically Choplifter. The game itself isn't really that exciting. Though it has a surprisingly dedicated fan. Oh. Oh. See, so one, of the, one of the annoying things about this game <laughs> So you, you know, it's 
a child player for you. You got bombs, you got guns, you fly around. One of the annoying things about this game is that when you fly to the left, your controls suddenly flip. So up is down and down is up. And then when you flip back, right? But there's also a button to do a barrel roll. And that basically lets you reverse the controls, sort of. Wow, the computer's really just gunning for me here. Um, but the magic of this game, right, is that I wanted people to realize this. This game was out in 1984, and you could network play on Imagine It. In 1984, there was LAN play. Mega Man 2 did not exist. Zelda 1 did not exist. Cyber Spy Mario was not Brothers, even in the U.S. yet. Mario Brothers, maybe around that was 85, right? But there was a LAN game. And if you went to like any college that had, you know, the second version of Sopwith, Sopwith 2, after ImagineNet went out of business, right? When that came out, it actually let you play with regular old networking. So everyone who had just DOS computers in a, in a you know, LAN, in a school computer lab, in a college computer lab, in a company, they all had Sopwith because they all got it for free. It was open source, whatever. Um, but the thing is, right, if you did LAN mode, Right? There's a lot of things to be gained from LAN mode that people aren't taking advantage of because they're not even thinking about it anymore. Right? The one thing, obviously, is everyone has their own screen and their own set of controls, right? which you know, counts for a lot. Uh, but also there's that, you know, that feeling that you're in the same room as the other guy. It's one thing to have the Xbox 360 headset, but when you're in the same room as the other people playing, you can yell out at them, you piece of shit. With the, right? well, because with the webcam, the picture of your genitalia is kind of grainy. It's not like really full of right? when there You get the full 3D experience in person. <laughs> right? But the, the real thing is when there's no lag, right? when you're developing a game, when you're programming a game, network code is the hardest thing to write. People don't realize this. And you see a lot of indie games come out and they just mess up the network play completely. It just doesn't work because it's so hard and they don't learn the lessons. You know, from the old, you know, people who've already figured it out, like John Carmack. Now, LANs, I mean, people aren't going to go to LAN parties as much as they used to. I don't really expect people to. Gaming laptops are usually not the most economical thing. But what we could do that a lot of people aren't doing, especially with these iPad apps, these phone apps, is that they don't give you local wireless multiplayer that works. And even with, like, the DS and the DSi, a lot of games don't take advantage of the fact you can have 10 people in a room and play a multiplayer game and do something interesting with it. They usually take an existing normal game and tack on some sort of multiplayer. You could make a game like Sopwith, put it on the DSi, and have, like, the planes flying around the room in 3D, like everyone's using the camera to look at the space. Yeah. Imagine if there were, like, 10 Sopwiths against 10 Sopwiths, like, and everyone was flying around and they couldn't, and you're crashing into your friends, right? That would be a good time, even though the graphics are really sad. They're not that sad. The Come cows on. are also add a lot of humor factor. Those are cows? Yeah, that right there is a cow on the bottom Kinda right. Kind of looks like a camel with a gun. <laughs> sure.